Good morning and happy new year. Welcome to this first week ahead of 2023 on Friday the 6th of January with me Michael Hewson as we look ahead to the week beginning the 9th of January and what is so far shaping up to be a fairly positive start to the week one and the year <coughs> for European markets. Um, US markets have found, I think, progress the opening few days of this week slightly more tricky. Um, I think there are a number of key questions that uh, need to be looked at um, when we look ahead to how markets may look to shape up over the course of the next 12 months. I think um, looking 12 months ahead is probably a little bit optimistic. I, th I don't think we can really look more than say three months ahead. Um, I think the key questions that we need to ask ourselves as we look ahead to this new year and having looked back at a year which has seen the likes of the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ um, lose quite a lot of ground um, from the record highs that we saw pretty much a year ago this week. Um, since those, those record highs, um, the NASDAQ and the S&P are pretty much gone one way. So the big question now, I think, as we look ahead to 2023, is whether or not we've actually seen the lows um, back in October, um, and whether or not we're in a position to potentially see a little bit of a rebound as we head into 2023, and certainly on the basis of these charts here, that doesn't look particularly likely. I think when you think about where we were a year ago, when the Fed funds rate was at 0.25% and is now currently at 4.5%, the, the ECB deposit rate a year ago was minus 0.5%, it's now at 2%. The Bank of England base rate a year ago was 0.25% and is now at 3.5%. The big question is, where is the terminal rate? Now, what do I mean by that? The terminal rate is ultimately where the central banks decide to stop hiking, leave rates where they are, and potentially look at when the next rate cut is likely to occur. So markets at the moment are pricing in the possibility that the, the first rate cut could come sometime this year. Now, certainly on the basis of some of the inflation data that we've been seeing over the course of the past two or three months, you, there is a case to be made that inflation has peaked. The big question is whether that peak um, and subsequent decline or disinflation will be enough to prompt central banks to start pulling rates lower. I'm skeptical about that. Um, I think a lot will depend by and large on the labor market, particularly in the US. And with today's non-farm payrolls numbers due out for December and this week's ADP reports much better than expected and weekly jobless claims back at their lowest levels, um, back at their lowest levels since um, the middle of the summer last year, I don't think the Fed has really any incentive to dial back the hawkish rhetoric quite yet. That's not to say that there aren't concerns about the aggressiveness of the tightening cycle that's taken place over the last 12 months. But I think the least we can expect, rather than a halt to rate hikes, is just simply a slower pace. Obviously, the next Fed meeting is at the end of this month, beginning of next month, 1st of February, is the next Fed rate decision at the moment, with the direction of travel that we've seen with yields this week and the dollar. Markets are pricing in the possibility that we'll get another 50 basis point rate hike on the 1st of February. Um, on the back of the 50 basis point rate hike that we got back in December. Um, so certainly I don't think we're going to get a, a further dialing back to 25 basis points at this point in time, simply on the basis of the fact that inflation is still very high, even though it is coming down. And this week's US CPI number or next week's US CPI number should offer further clues on that. But what's particularly, I think, interesting in the wider scheme of things is while that US CPI is coming down, and it's been coming down since June last year. 
Um, wage growth, particularly when we saw the ADP report, um, in some areas is trending at around between seven and 10%. So it's actually trending. Private sector wage growth is trending above headline inflation in the US. And I don't think the Fed is gonna be overly happy about that. So I think the expectation is we could well see a little bit of a stronger dollar in the first quarter of this year or an attempt to rebound. But I do not think we will see or revisit the highs in the dollar that we saw um, during um, the last part of last year. Um, so looking, looking at the S&P 500 chart, we're still very much in a downtrend for the S&P. This is the weekly chart that we're looking at here. If I change that to a daily chart, we can see that we got a little bit of a break above there, but what was significant was we weren't able to close above it. And consequently, um, the weakness that we've been seeing in US equity markets is likely to prevail in the short to medium term. I think the NASDAQ 100 in particular is very instructive in that, con in that context because if we look at a, a daily chart here, we can see that there's been virtually no rebound in the NASDAQ 100. And that's not really altogether surprising when you consider that some of the valuations that we're seeing on the NASDAQ are still very rich indeed. Um, declines in the share price of companies like Tesla, for example, have been very, very sharp. And yet, despite these declines, Tesla has still got a valuation of in, in excess of $350 billion, which seems very, very high for a company that generally um, delivers just over a million electric vehicles per year, um, way below the levels of production of some of the big, um, more traditional um, auto makers. So the big question I think heading forward is whether or not we are in danger of seeing an imminent rebound in the NASDAQ. And based on this chart here, the lows, the lows are very key here, 10,400. The, the, the peaks that we've been seeing from the rebounds are continuing to struggle below the trend line from the highs um, last year and also the 200 day moving average. So the trend is still very much towards lower NASDAQ and a lower S&P 500. Until that trend is broken, then you really have to play along with the overall price action. So um, the key questions that I think people are going to be asking this year, where's the terminal rate for central banks? Um, at the last ECB meeting, Christine Lagarde suggested that it was around about 3%, and yet with the current ECB rate at around 2%, and the fact that the intention is to hike rates at successive meetings by at least 50 basis points for the next three meetings, would suggest that the terminal rate for the ECB is not 3%, but it's above that. So there is no clear idea, and I don't think anyone has any clear idea of where the terminal rate is for the ECB. Is it 3%, is it 3.5%? Same applies to the Bank of England. What's the terminal rate for the Bank of England? The current Bank of England rate is 3.5%. Um, the UK economy is probably now already in recession, having contracted in Q3. It's quite likely we will have seen a contraction in Q4 as well. So I think the big question going forward is how much more room has the Bank of England got to hike rates as we head into 2023? I suspect that they won't be able to be any more aggressive as perhaps deserve, is likely to be or could be over the course of the next few months. So as we look back at this week's price action, it's been a fairly positive start of the year for markets in Europe. We can see that with the DAX here, seeing fairly decent gains for the past two, three days, near the top end of the range around about 14,576. What's particularly interesting is that we haven't been able to move above that yet, which suggests that there may be some natural resistance there. So we'll need to keep an eye on that to see whether or not that is sustainable. Uh, the FTSE 100 has got off to an absolute flyer uh, this week. Looking at the weekly chart here, we can see there's big resistance at 76.86. 
we're pretty much close to that now and also the highs from last year at 76.89 so we're at the top end of the range um, on the FTSE 100 the bigger question is whether or not we can make new record highs um, from the levels that we saw all the way back um, in 2018 when we got as high as 7,900. I'm of the opinion, particularly given the fact that growth, um, growth stocks are likely to have a very, very hard time of it this year. I'm of the opinion that we could well see the FTSE 100 at 8,000 by the end of this year and potentially beyond that. Um, I see no reason why we shouldn't, given the fact that value, I think value is going to be a theme for this year over growth. Um, when you've got US Treasury yields at 4.5% or there or thereabouts, um, you know, why would you be investing in growth store in growth stocks at a time when the global economy is probably going to struggle this year? Yes, we have seen oil prices come down, we've seen natural natural gas prices come down, but consumers are going to find it very, very difficult this year, even accounting for the fact that we might see um, we might see a milder recession that is currently than is currently being priced in. Um, I think now that money has a value, I think some of the more frothy areas of the market may well struggle. And certainly I would include the NASDAQ in that description as being one of the frothy areas of the market. We're probably going to see further potential bankruptcies. Um, we've got the start of US earnings season this coming week with US bank earnings. We've also got UK retail um, announcing their latest numbers in the upcoming week as well. And we've certainly got off to a good start this week with the likes of Next, B&M B&M European Retail um, posted some fairly decent numbers for the pre-Christmas trading period. I think the bigger question is whether or not those retailers can sustain that into 2023. And I think on that, but the jury is very much out. Certainly in terms of the pre-Christmas trading statements, I'll be keeping a particular eye on Sainsbury's um, this week. We've seen a fairly decent rebound um, over the course of the past few days on the back of the positivity um, that we've seen from the likes of Aldi and Lidl, which posted some fairly, fairly decent pre-Christmas numbers as well as obviously, as I mentioned earlier, Next um, and B&M European Value Retail. Um, so potentially there is there is scope for arguing that perhaps Sainsbury's and the likes of Marks and Spencer, potentially the good news on that is probably already priced in. Um, looking at Marks and Spencer there, again, we've got a fairly decent lift um, earlier this week on the back of the next numbers. So MS Q3 numbers, I've written about them in my week ahead update, which you can find on the website. I've written about Tesco's Q3 numbers. They're also due out on the 12th. And as I mentioned earlier, Sainsbury's are due out on the 11th. So it's a big week for a further big week for UK retail. We've also got the latest quarterly numbers from Premier Owner Whitbread um, on the 12th of January as well. And then, of course, on the 13th, on Friday, we've got Q4 numbers from the likes of JP Morgan Chase, Citigroup, Bank of America, um, where we could get a fairly decent idea of how the US consumer is feeling and whether or not um, these banks have seen fit to set aside further loan loss provisions um, in the same way that they did in Q3, um, in, 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 their, in their Q3 numbers. So it'll be, as I say, JP Morgan will be particularly interesting given the fact that the US banking sector had a fairly disappointing year last year. Um, if we go back to, say for example, here we go here, that we did see a little bit of a rebound from the lows, but we are finding a fairly decent area of resistance for JP Morgan in and around this 138, 140 dollar area. So it'll be interesting to note whether or not we're able to crack through that resistance level on the publication of the JP Morgan Chase numbers. Again, I've written about those numbers 
um, on, on the news and analysis section of the CMC Markets website, and you can find that under Learn News and Analysis, and that will be there um, later this afternoon. So that'll give you a good indication as to um, what the expectations are um, with respect to those numbers. We've also got Bed Bath & Beyond. They filed for Chapter 11, or there's reports they're filing for Chapter 11. So that could be um, their, their numbers on the 10th, their Q3 numbers on the 10th could well be um, another US company, another US retailer that could well be going to the wall. In terms of currencies, next week we've talked about has the dollar peaked? Certainly in terms of euro dollar US CPI, um, I think the debate or the discussion over the course of the past few weeks is whether or not we'll see a dollar rebound. And if we do, which does seem likely at the moment, how far do, do we rebound? Certainly, I think in, in the context of euro dollar here, we struggled at around about 107.40. And there is the probability in the event of a decent payrolls report um, that we could see further dollar strength, further weakness in um, US equity markets and potentially see euro dollar come back down towards 104 and 103. We have seen the 50 day moving average and the 200 day moving average cross over positively, uh, but we saw that happen a few days ago. And since then we've tracked back lower. That is a potential, um, that is a potential golden cross. And people have said that when the 50 day moving averages crosses the 200 day moving average, that generally portends to be a bullish sign. Um, that is true to a point. The point being, is that the 200 day moving average and the 50 day new moving average need to be pointing in the same direction. And they're not, the 200 day moving average is still falling. So that suggests that the long term um, trend still remains down for Euro dollar, even as the short term trend is starting to show signs of positivity. So for me, yeah, you can argue that's a golden cross, but the fact that 200 day moving average is still declining on a day to day basis dilutes the value of it as a credible signal and certainly as a signal on its own it, it, it's not particularly reliable it needs to be used in conjunction with other signals as well so the key support on euro dollar here is around about 105 if we break below 105 then we could well see euro dollar slip back down towards this nexus of two moving averages here um, which should act as support in the short to medium term. So in this case, the golden cross, I'm ignoring it because it doesn't have that much of a value in terms of the overall price action that I'm seeing. And the fact that we broke below this series of lows through here on Euro dollar, which does suggest that we've got the potential for further weakness in the short to medium term. And I think this is important. I think when people listen and talk and listen to people and they talk about golden crosses and death crosses and what have you. Yeah, they're all well and good, but you need to actually put them in a context. And given the fact that 200 day moving average is still falling, then that dilutes the effectiveness of any signal um, crossover on the moving average. You've got to look at the overall direction of the moving average as well and the price action that precedes it. So on that basis alone, I don't trust that that golden cross on euro dollar. Anyway, as for cable, similarly, we've broken below 120, um, which is disappointing and undermines a bullish case in the short to medium term. It also means that we could potentially slip all the way back to 116 in the event of a fairly decent US payrolls report and, and obviously US CPI for December, which is coming up next week as well. I think the CPI numbers for next week are likely to point to an additional narrative of further weakening US core inflation, expecting core prices to subside from 6% in November to 5.7%, and the headline CPI number to also drop sharply as well. So back, back into the spec, back to around about 6.5% from 7.1%. So certainly US inflation is falling but it's still well above the Fed's 2% target, which may, leads me to believe that they will still want to keep their foot hard on the floor when it comes to hiking rates. What's also particularly interesting in terms of the dollar bullish narrative is that we've seen a fairly decent rebound in dollar yen. Um, certainly could well see 
of having hit a low of 129.50, we could well see a move back all the way back to the 200 day moving average now that we've broken below it and which we broke below and broke below aggressively back in December, we could well see a short squeeze all the way back to as high as around about 137 and a half on the dollar yen. And what's particularly interesting here is I'll be interested to see how this weekly candle plays out because if we get a bullish reversal here, then we could actually see a move all the way back to 142 and a half. Um, if we get a very strong weekly close on this weekly dollar yen on this on this weekly dollar yen chart, so keep an eye on the weekly close on dollar yen. It could give you a bullish reversal, which could signal a move all the way back to the 50-day moving average in the short to medium term, as well as obviously the peaks that we saw here at 138.20, and more broadly a return to these peaks at 142.20. If we work out what the Fibonacci retracements are for this down move here. That can also give us a potential target. And again, around about 140 um, is probably, I think, the least we can expect in the short to medium term of any dollar rebound. Um, but I do not think that we will see a move back um, much above 142.50 in the short to medium term. But certainly I think the, 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 the dollar has, I think the dollar has peaked. But the bigger question is, how big this current rebound um, becomes before we start to turn lower again. Um, okay, so that's um, so just to quickly recap, I think I've pretty much done everything that I need to do. Also, Brent crude, we're down towards the lows, and this again reinforces the disinflationary narrative that is likely to feed through in the headline numbers when it comes to um, headline inflation. But unfortunately, the Fed's the central bank focus is now shifting towards wages and services cost inflation and core prices more than the headline number. So I think when we're looking at inflation over the course of the next few months, we need to be focusing on core services inflation and worry less about the headline number, because I think that's where most of the central bank attention will be when it comes to looking at the data. We've also got the latest China trade numbers, which are due out next week as well for December. Um, China has obviously really has has dropped an awful lot of its zero COVID policy in an attempt to try and reopen its economy. But that, in effect, will also have significant downside um, consequences as a result of um, people isolating, hospitals being overrun as infection rates soar, and that's likely to keep. Um, Chinese demand fairly subdued into the first quarter of next year. And then really it's a question of how quickly the Chinese economy rebounds in Q2 and Q3. And for me, I think that still um, rem remains uh, remains a fairly significant unknown in the short to medium term. In any case, that's it for the first week ahead of 2023. Once again, I'd like to wish you all a happy and profitable new year. And I'll speak to you all same time, same place, um, uh, this time next week.